You know, folks, as it turns out, there's a lot of similarities between freshwater fishing and saltwater fishing. My associate, the offshore fishing expert, Lauren's going to show us what goes into uh, putting together some presentations that work and has some really cool science, so stick around. Okay, Randy, what I'm going to show you here are some slides I prepared that show why the tuna are in certain locations um, off New York, in this case, in the fall. First thing to notice here is that tuna are a, a schooling fish. They swim in, in, in large schools of a hundred to, to several hundred tuna, normally in, in weight classes or actually by year of birth. So if you're catching 40 pound tuna, all the tuna you're catching will be 40 pound tuna and you'll very rarely catch something that's 80 pounds. Okay. If you, you go into a, a school of 80 pound tuna, they'll all be in the, the 70 to 90 pound kind of range. Tuna are actually located all around the temperate zones of the world, which you can see here on the slide in red. But they're not located in all, the, the, all these areas all the time. They're in specific areas at certain times of the year following a migration pattern. I'm going to show you the migration pattern that's used um, that applies to the Atlantic coast, but you get the same kind of migration pattern in all the other oceans in the world. It looks like it's a worldwide ban there. It's a worldwide ban around basically water that's in the 65 to 85 degree temperature zone, although the tuna seem to really prefer something in the 70 to, to 75 uh, degree range. So it's a warm water fish. It's a warm water tropical fish, and what's interesting is because of the Gulf Stream, that those tropical waters come way up the eastern coast. Okay. Uh, you can also see on the slide they come way up the Pacific coast near Japan, which is one of the great areas for tuna fishing as well. Um, one of the reasons why the Japanese like sushi so much. There's a lot of coastline there. There's a lot of coastline, but if you tried fishing at any arbitrary time of the year, you wouldn't catch any fish. You really need to know where their migration patterns are and the reasons why they're following those migration patterns. Well, we're going to start um, looking at the winter spawning grounds. So the winter spawning grounds are located in the tropics, uh, basically from the Gulf of Mexico down to about Trinidad. And the tuna uh, move down there in the winter. The water obviously is warmer there as well in the winter. Then in the spring they start to move north, following the water that's, following the water as the, the Gulf Stream, and moving north as far as the temperature range will take them. What they're following as they move along are the bait fish that also are moving north at the same time. They eat mai mai. Um, we're going to be catching mai mai on this trip, which are too large for the tuna, but the tuna do eat smaller mai mai, and they also um, eventually they're going to really gorge on other bait fish that are that are sp um, spawned along the coastline and then start to move offshore in the fall. So they reach their, their furthest peak north in the summer. Uh, in the case of fish off the Atlantic coast, that's um, somewhere off Cape Cod, a little bit north of Cape Cod by only about 50 miles, so they don't really go into the Georgia's banks to any great extent. And they're still offshore at this time because the water along the coastline is very, is still cold. But in the fall, the water has warmed up inshore. And at the same time as the water's warmed up on shore, the, the bait that has been born that year, butterfish and squid, both of which spawn on the shoreline, start to move off to the continental shelf for wintering. They move off to where it's warmer, and it's warmer out by the continental shelf because of the Gulf Stream. They move south along the U.S. coast, and uh, if you wanted to, you could actually fish from, from July off Cape Cod to, to December off Florida, fishing for the same basic group of, of tuna that have migrated south. So the tuna follow the food south as temperatures cool until they reach their winter spawning grounds. So now in terms of where the fish are located, the fish will be in, in the small schools and as they move up in the spring they're way offshore, much too far for most boats um, 
to go fishing for them, let's say 250 to 300 miles offshore. And then in the fall, they come in quite close to shore, within a range of 100 to 150 miles offshore, so um, makes it much more feasible to go fishing in the fall along the coastline. That's where you guys got them on the first continental break? That's where we got them along the continental shelf, and we're going to see that it's not just the continental shelf, but there's some very important structures along the shelf called canyons, which we're going to take a look at shortly. So finally the fish head back to the winter spawning grounds and are pretty much completely gone from east coast fishing, although people fishing off Florida and the tropics can go out and fish for tuna uh, all throughout the winter season. A similar sort of view here shows where tuna can be caught with long line gear. This is used by commercial fishermen. Um, and so it's a little bit more refined graph in terms of their distribution. Uh, commercial fishermen obviously want to go to the points where there are the most fish in most parts of the year. Um, and this image also shows you the spawning areas um, throughout the tropics from, from Africa to the middle of the Pacific Ocean to the area off uh, South America from basically Cuba all the way across to waters off, uh, off West Africa. So the season and topography play a big part with these guys. They do. I need to think about it. So this shows the canyon structure located off New York. Montauk is here at the end, and about 150 miles offshore, you get the edge of the continental shelf. The most famous canyon here is, is the Hudson Canyon, which starts quite close to New York City and then extends very rapidly down deep. Um, since we leave out of Montauk, we don't normally go down to the Hudson Canyon, which is too far away, but go more east to fish off a couple canyons here, one called Veach and one called Ge Hydrographer's Canyon, and those are the areas that are actually shown uh, in the footage on the boat. The, the tuna we're fishing for in September and October are located along this continental shelf edge along certain canyons. So this slide, Randy, just shows you the, the Hudson Canyon. I show it only because the, the image was so clear on, on Google Maps where I took this from. But you can see here how the canyon looks sort of like the Grand Canyon. In fact, it's as deep as the Grand Canyon, if not actually deeper. And Charlie will take a look at the actual the depth that you're, we're fishing in here. So this canyon was cut millions of years ago through the, um, the layer at the edges of the continental shelf. And as we'll see, it extends from about 100 feet up at this end to 1,000 feet deep in the middle of the canyon to 2,000 feet right here off the sort of the cliff edge along the edge of the canyon. The tuna can be anywhere in here, but because of the, the way the Gulf Stream hits against the edges of this canyon, it creates eddies that concentrate the bait fish. Where are the bait fish at this time? The bait fish are located could be anywhere along these canyon edges, depending on how the current and the temperature um, causes microscopic life to, to sort of swell up towards the surface where the, the, the whole food chain um, eats from the diatoms on up to, to squid and, and butterfish and other such fish, bringing the, um, the tuna in as well. Now I have a question. Why, yeah. are, the, why are the plankton there? <laughs> I hope you don't mind. No, that's a very good question. I mean, obviously, plankton are pretty much every, everywhere in the ocean, but the issue here is the concentration of plankton due to, one, the warmth of the Gulf Stream and the fact that the currents tend to concentrate the plankton into just certain areas. Groups. Into groups of plankton, if you want, but okay. it... But it Plankton obviously aren't schooling animals, they're, they're microorganisms, right. so it's partly sort of a physical thing dealing with the, the current and the temperatures of the water and the fact that the water temperature is actually up well towards the surface. Okay, it's the same thing with uh, wind planting with walleyes. Same thing as that, exactly. Now this slide we'll see how rapidly the depth changes. So we'll notice that the, the depth on the edge of the canyon, about 150 miles off New York, is, is 100 feet deep. Within a, about a 30, 40 miles range, 
the continental shelf only drops in depth to 200 feet. At the same time, however, within the canyon itself, you get depths of 1,000 feet. So in the middle of this canyon, you get a depth of 1,000 feet, which is, an enormous, canyon, which is an enormous depth for a canyon. And in fact, we see here that 2,000 feet is not much farther away. 2,000 feet comes all the way up into here. That's a half a mile. So these canyons are quite, quite sort of severe in nature and really play the, the fundamental role in, in concentrating the bait fish and then concentrating the tuna. Well, tuna are kind of interesting because their circulatory system makes them a war, almost a warm-blooded animal. Their blood is extraordinarily red, as you'll see in some of the pictures. Um, and the fact that their blood is, is, is warm allows them to process their food and much more efficiently. And we'll see as well that tuna have very small stomachs. They're constantly eating. Their entire body is basically muscle, which drives them 24 hours a day to search for food. To, to keep them moving. So they're highly migratory, they have small stomachs, they're made up of mostly muscle, they move a lot, they eat constantly. Correct. Well, that's what makes them easy to catch, I suppose. Well, it makes them fun to catch because they make them one of the, <laughs> probably the, the strongest fish pound per pound in the world. When yeah. you compare them to other fish, most other fish just do not have the kind of muscle mass uh, compared to their size. Is that the same with uh, albacore too? It's the same with all tuna. All tuna. All, all tuna are the same. The difference in tuna is primarily the size and also where they're located in the water. So, so yellowfin will actually grow up to 300 pounds, although the tuna that we're fishing for are normally in the, the 40 to 120 pound range. Bluefin tuna will get up to 2,000 pounds. It's an all day fight. Albacore are much smaller tuna, um, but the, most of us are familiar with albacore from t canned tuna. Uh -huh. Albacore is a very white meat. Yellowfin tuna has a sort of a darker meat. It doesn't look as good in the can. Right. And then bluefin is very dark. And if you've eaten in a Japanese restaurant, you'll see basically very, very dark blue meat okay. from, from bluefin tuna. There's the sushi effect. Pause. Break. So we can see here that tuna normally grow from 16 to 67 inches. Um, but they can go as large as 75 inches and 388 plus pounds. They don't mature until they're 40 inches, but they mature in a couple of years. And spawning for tuna will happen throughout the year in, in the areas that are warm enough. Uh, the tuna that we're fishing for migrate south to spawn. The fish eat, or tuna eat, from ballyhoo, pilchard, squid, and then in the New York area, butterfish as well. The other fish we're fishing for are dolphin. People are familiar with saying uh, the dolphin fish, otherwise known as mai mai in most restaurants, El Dorado in Spanish, Pompano as well. It's probably the most beautiful fish in the ocean because of its color. Um, it's also a very, very tasty fish, the reason why it's, it's served in so many restaurants. The mai mai and the tuna are found pretty much in the same location. Um, mai mai are kind of fun to fish for. You fish for them with lighter line. Although during the, when we were trolling, we were catching both mai mai and some tuna. That looks like the big fish from the, from the videos. This, this, the fish that you see here is a, called a bull dolphin or a bull mai mai. It's a male mai mai that's 20 to 40 pounds in size and they do get as large as 100 pounds in size. This actually was the first bull dolphin I've seen caught off the Atlantic coast. Off no, actually, the, the big fish had a, had a more pointed nose. Um, there is another fish that's even larger than this called a wahoo. That's it. That's um, the wahoo, it was actually the first wahoo I've seen caught off New York as well. Um, most people catch wahoo off Florida. Um, it's a very, very tasty fish. I just finished uh, <laughs> a meal of wahoo wahoo this week as I came home. Um, because the wahoo was caught by the, by the captain on the boat and not any of the fishermen, and he shared it with everyone on the boat, which nice. is nice to do. Very nice. 